you recognize this man? Well, that man, Edward, is Malcolm Rivers. He's had a very troubled life. He was arrested four years ago and convicted of the murder of six people in a violent rampage. Did this. He developed a condition that is commonly known as multiple personality syndrome. Why are you telling me this? Because you, Edward, are one of his personalities. Wearing its central theme on its sleeve, 2003's Identity gave audiences a fresh take on the murder mystery by translating Psycho's lonely motel into a bustling cerebral complex filled with an array of characters. Lost amid a whodunit murder plot, our characters scramble to find the person responsible. But as all of their personas are thrown into the mix, we come to question a whole lot more than simply who killed who. No, you've been trying to run this show the whole night. You've been giving orders, you've been pointing fingers, you blame my con for everything, and he ends up dead. I'm telling you, it's him! The titular identity can refer to many different things. Most obviously, the multiple personalities of the murderer Malcolm, who sits on death row but also of the clearly identifiable identities held by each of the incredibly contrasting characters. But while these explanations are the most evident, the film's interest lies elsewhere, a fact elucidated by William Hughes Mearns' poem Antigonish, which opens and closes the film. As I was going up the stair, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. I wish, I wish he'd go away. This instead points to the notion that the film is talking about something wholly less tangible. Paired with the psychological disorder Malcolm suffers from, this points to identity's fundamental debate not in fact being how we define our identity, but how our own identity is crafted by things we can't quite put our fingers on. While this leads to an exciting debate, the whirlwind narrative strikes a complex balance between themes and plot, meaning many first-time viewers may be left stumped by what they've seen. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and as requested, today we'll be exploring the meaning of James Mangold's identity. Identity has two parallel storylines which unfold at the same time. The first takes place in a motel and plays out like a murder mystery, while the second occurs in a courthouse. As the film opens, we start in our second narrative, hearing the voices of psychologist Dr. Malik and his patient Malcolm, who's explained as being on death row for a string of horrific murders. Malik and Malcolm's defense attorney push for a re-evaluation of Malcolm's case one day before his execution. But before we can fully understand the importance of this plot, we're warped into another world. Here, a whole cast of characters find themselves amid a torrential storm in the dead of night, all gathering at a motel due to one interconnected disaster after another. Husband and wife George and Alice York and their son Timothy are driving down the road when they suffer a punctured tyre caused by a shoe dropped on the road by a prostitute named Paris. While they're taking a look, Ed, the ex-police officer driver of actress Caroline, loses focus for a moment and plows into Alice, leaving her as good as dead. Arriving at the nearest motel and meeting its supposed owner, they're advised to head to the hospital about 30 miles away. But the roads are blocked and Ed's car gets stuck. Luckily, they run into newlyweds Ginny and Lou Lisiano, who offer them a ride back. Returning to the motel, a police officer named Rhodes turns up with the inmate Robert. But with his police radio dead, he offers little more than a superficial air of hope. To get through? No, not yet. Maybe we should take turns on the radio if that's all right. No, it's not. I can manage. While the group decide to get a room and wait out the storm, Caroline goes out looking for a cell phone signal to call her agent. Grabbing the shower curtain from the rack as a portable rain jacket, she's suddenly murdered, rattling everyone when her head crudely turns up in a washing machine. Finding that Robert had escaped, they're all quick to point fingers, but agree to stay put. Ginny then flies off the handle and admits that she isn't pregnant, making the reason for her and Lou's marriage a lie. But before he can celebrate with the boys, Lou is also slashed by an unknown assailant. Meanwhile, Ed discovers a keychain on Lou's corpse numbered 9 that matches the one found on Caroline's head with the number 10. As tensions rise, the shaken Larry jumps in his truck and accidentally runs down George. With Larry tied up, they reconvene, and the superstitious Ginny puts these strange happenings down to the motel being built on a Native American burial ground, suggesting that there must be a reason that they're all here together. Alice then expires from her wounds, leaving a keychain with a number six, forcing them to venture outside, where they find seven on George's corpse. Ed encourages Ginny and Timmy to leave, but as they pile into a car, it explodes, marking Ginny as number five. You did this! You did this! You told them to get into the car! You happy? 
Not only are the group clueless as to who's committing these acts, but when they head back inside, the survivors find that all evidence of what had transpired is gone. As they realize that they all mysteriously shared the same birthday and each have a city or state in their names, the Rattled Ed begins to recite the poem from the film's opening. This snaps him out of the motel and into our secondary narrative, where he's interrogated by Dr. Malik and lawyers, who explain that Ed is one personality within Malcolm, who suffers from dissociative identity disorder. Malik then explains that Malcolm's many personalities are unorthodoxly being reduced down to one, potentially paving the way for one of his innocent identities to take control over his mind. Malcolm is in the midst of a medical treatment, one which forces all his identities to confront one another for the first time. And with it, the number of the identities will be reduced. It's at this point that Paris finds documents proving that Rhodes isn't a police officer, but a convicted criminal. Rhodes confronts her, but Ed comes to the rescue, resulting in Larry being shot before Ed and Rhodes shoot each other and bleed out, leaving the harmless Paris as the only personality left. Back in the courthouse, his lawyers use this to get Malcolm taken off death row and transferred to a psychiatric hospital. As he's transferred, we also see Paris arrive at a rural home in an orange grove, where she finds the final keychain with the number one before being killed by Timmy. With Timmy, who had actually been responsible for the death of every other identity, now the only one left, Malcolm kills Malik in the transport vehicle and escapes into the world. But before we can understand the ending, we need to explore some of the themes presented to us. Identity has two on the nose references hidden within it, Antigonish, and more importantly, being in nothingness. Although Malcolm attests having come up with the poem himself, William Hughes Mearns' Antigonish revolves around a person that keeps seeing a man before him, one that he knows isn't really there. The poem's simplicity, combined with its unclear subject, a man who wasn't there, lend it an incredibly uncanny feel, one which we feel throughout the entirety of identity, given the fact that we're given so little information about both the characters in the motel and the real case of Malcolm's murders. Antigonish was reportedly inspired by ghost stories of a man roaming the stairs of a haunted house in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. This feels like more than coincidence, given the fact that both the poem and Malcolm, the character who recites it, exist in multiple split but connected versions. Perhaps this misattribution of the poem as a self-creation pushes these themes even further, asking us to question how we can truly understand the identity of anything in a world where we're only ever given partial information. These questions are presented more directly by the second reference, French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre's work Being in Nothingness, which we see in a lengthy close-up near the opening of the film. Being in Nothingness is widely considered one of Sartre's most important works. It develops a philosophical account in support of the ideas of existentialism, dealing with topics such as consciousness, perception, social philosophy, self-deception, the existence of nothingness, psychoanalysis, and the question of free will, all of which are almost fundamental to the construction of one or more identity. Important to note are the spectacular changes in handwriting style, tone, point of view. What you are looking at are the private thoughts of several different people. While these questions of identity are relevant in as much as asking who is Malcolm, they actually give little fruit in the greater analysis of the characters within Malcolm's psyche. This is because when looking at the characters at the motel, we have something much simpler, a cross-section of personality and class traits that Malcolm had encountered in his life and compartmentalized into idiosyncratic identities. Caroline finds herself at the top, pompous, high class and recognized within society. Hey. Didn't you used to be that actress? <sighs> Lou is the inverse, a naive young man adhering to societal tradition. Robert is the embodiment of criminal mischief. George is a straight and narrow family man. Alice, like George, is the unfortunate victim of the world. Ginny is a superstitious determinist, set on the idea that the world presents coincidence beyond their comprehension. Larry is the imposter, quite literally taking the identity of the real owner of the motel. Rhodes is a false authority figure, in fact just working to assert his own personal gain. Ed is the true righteous authority figure, working for the sake of altruism, not profit. Paris is the most complex, representing Malcolm's mother, a prostitute symbolically encapsulating lust, while simultaneously an innocent, searching for a way out of that life. Timothy, on the other hand, is the repressed, the silent force which never makes itself seen or heard until it explodes in a rage of anger and hate. 
In the end, the identity that wins out is the one that best represented how Malcolm saw himself, a child driven to unrestrained hatred by the pain of his past at the treatment of others. This is the hidden genius of identity. On the one hand, we have a serial killer on the loose that despises every segment of society, but on the other, one that has seemingly cured himself of his mental illness. Remember that movie where the ten strangers went to an island and then they all died one by one? And then it turned out they weren't strangers, that they all had a connection. It's your birthday next week? It's my birthday next week. The 10th. Me too. Me too.